Hi, I'm Ron. I'm Ralph. And welcome to, we don't really know what we're going to call this name of the show yet, but we'll talk about that a little bit later here. So, Ralph, what are you up to tonight? Well, uh, you know, we've talked about doing this show for a while, so here we are. Here Give we are. Try. See what happens. Here we are, talking about anything and everything slot cars around the world, the United States, regional racing, national racing. Whatever pops up, whatever comes up, controversies, we'll talk about it. Hopefully, if all goes well, by the end of the year, we'll have tens of listeners. Ten? Or tens. T- tens of tens. Tens of tens, maybe hundreds. Who knows? But we hope to uh, entertain everybody and educate them and just spread uh, goodwill and cheer about slot car racing, I guess. Yep. So... Anything uh, on your mind before we get going? Yeah, we got to come up with a name for this thing. <laughs> um, you know, I know we've bounced some things back and forth, but uh, if anybody out there has any suggestions or ideas, let us know. Yep. Uh, there will be a Facebook page probably about the time this video goes up, and you can send us messages there, and we will uh, look and, and look at all and consider all and see what we come up with. There you go. No contests, no giveaways. So, anyway, moving right along. So, uh, I got a I got a question for you. Okay. Um, being the owner of Fast Ones, you've been in the motor business for many years, and you've also been involved in doing some RC motors and stuff like that over the years. There's a pretty interesting topic going on right now on Sloplog about motor dynos. Okay. And some people seem to think that they can create some sort of device using a propeller or a flywheel and put a load on a motor and get a dyno reading, whether it be RPMs or amps or volts or, or something else. What do you think about all that? Have you tried any of them? You know, what you, I mean, what's your experience? Okay, well, in slot racing the last few years, everyone's used one of these. Yeah. And um, over the years in RC racing, there's been slave dynos where you, you connect a motor to another motor and you run it at certain volts and you flip switches and make the motor, the slave motor, put a load on the real motor while it puts out RPMs and, and amps and other kind of levels and you know, you try and you try and determine how a motor is going to run under load, but I don't think you can ever duplicate the load on the machine that you can actually uh, what what the motor actually does on the track. Um, right. Like the like the Trinity Dyno or the the Magic Horsepower thing, whatever they call it. Um, it it's monster a monster machine. Monster machine. It's a neat yeah. little tool, but to me, it's just an RPM checker or reader because you can't really put any kind of big loads on it. And right. I also believe that the best dyno is actually on the track itself. I mean, when I go to a race, if I got two motors or 10 motors or whatever, I run all the motors through one car to, f- to find out which motor runs the best on those track conditions. And, and right. what runs good today may not run good tomorrow, even on the same track, same car, same tires, because the, the bite of the surface, traction of the surface, determines how a motor runs or how the motor pulls. So, so you've got RPMs plus you've got torque. Right. And I've never really seen a dyno for slot cars tell us anything much about torque. Right. So, and with a dyno, you can you could have five motors that all read the same, but they probably won't run the same on the track in the same car on the same day. Right. So, and you can make motors. You can manipulate a motor by changing the gearing, changing the brush spring tension. Like you can go up a tooth, down a tooth on the, the crown or the spur. Right. With a pinion. So, like, well, you can gear a car for more straightaway speed and more RPM, then you lose torque and brakes. Go to right. smaller, you lose the RPM or the top end, and you gain bottom end torque and brakes. So, but, I mean, most of our motors that we run in classes, we know how we're going to gear them. You know, like – Certain motors, you know, you got to run an eight-tooth pinion. If you put a nine on it, it's going to burn up. Or if you run a nine on it, you put a ten on it, right. it's going to burn up. 
So, so, so we kind of know what we're going to do gear wise, but it's just a fine tuning of spur gears and crown gears and just changing the number of teeth. So back to your dyno thing. I mean, back in the RC days and when fast ones did RC motors and when every other company did RC motors, we all had dynos and you had to sell your motors based on dyno readings and you'd put a sticker on them. And of course, you know, people, that's how people bought the motors. But even with that said, one time I went to an RC race and a guy came over and said, Hey, I want to try one of your motors. And I said, okay. So I handed him a motor. He went over, uh, five minutes later, he comes back and he says, that motor's junk. I said, right. It's junk. He goes, that's the worst dyno and motor I've ever seen in my life. Okay. I said, why don't you just put it in your car and you, and you run in the first race. And if you don't do well, I'll buy you a new set of tires for your car. And we'll go from there. So he puts the motor in, goes out, runs the first race, new track record. <laughs> now he wants to there buy the go. motor. I told him, no, it's not for sale. <laughs> so he's a guy, and he wanted to win the A-Main and setting all kinds of lap records in the process. So right. you can't always go by the dyno readings. You know, I agree. Yeah. And, when, and when I see guys doing 15 retro hot motors, sure, they can have 23,000 to 28,000. And, and the best – the best retro hawk I ever seen on a, a, a Trinity machine has been like 32,000 RPM. Most guys will tell you. How many volts is that at? Six. Six. Okay. That's what I, that's what I do check mine at. Right. I think, I think everybody, because I think that's what was suggested from Trinity in the beginning was six volts. Okay. So, but again, if you, and that's another thing too. I mean, when we run our slot car motors, we don't run them at a constant voltage. Right. Okay. We run them. Yeah, the track has 14 volts or 13 volts, whatever. Let's say it has 14 volts. We're not running wide open at 14 volts unless it's like a wing car or, or something you just stand in a hole wide open. Right. Get down to flexi cars, stock car bodies, and low downforce bodies, you have to drive them. Then probably you should be checking your motors on your dyno at 6 volts and 8 volts and whatever and see what the difference is through the range of the motor. Because some motors are going to run run better or have more RPMs or whatever on lower voltage versus the higher voltage. I mean, it could be exactly the opposite. What's high on 6 volts RPM-wise could be the lower on the 8 volts. Yeah, I know I found just recently this year from running the FNRS races that we started out the season at Tracy's Slot Car Us. Yep. And, you know, that's that's a punch bowl, state-of-the-art king track right. on, on pretty high power. And I checked all my motors, broke them in, and got some RPM readings on them before we went to the race. And I found at that track on such high power that pretty much the ones with the most RPMs did run the best. Okay. Then as we went to the next race at Mark's Model World where the power was 13.5, that's a pretty big reduction. Right. And once we got there, you know, the, the motor performance was no longer in line with my RPM readings at all. It was wow. just, it was all out of whack. Yep. And, you know, our next race we're going to this coming weekend, actually, it's guys 13.5 power too. So right. I know for me, it's just going to be one of those things where you just got to plug, like you said, plug all every motor and all the cars and just see what you get. Yep. And just use one car to do all your motors. Right. Then you go back and you start putting motors in cars to find out what your better car is. But right. yeah. that's a whole other issue. Right. Yeah. That's another, that's another show. Yeah. Um, so you know, I, I also found, you know, that I just kind of assumed that my top motors with 13 tooth pinions would be my top motors with 10 tooth pinions. No. Yeah, and I, and I quickly found out that that was a mistake to assume that. So right. you got twice as much work to do now. Right. But, well, you know, I think a lot of guys know. in the FNRS that run LMP and stock car with the same motor, it's just a it's just a pinion change and a body change, and the body is really not the big factor on the motor performance. But right when when you have all your motors, you got to run through all your motors with ten tooth pinions and find your best ones with tens. Then you got to run back through all of them with thirteens on them and find your best ones there. And then most guys are finding that their, their best motors with 10s aren't their best motors with 13s. Right. Yeah. And I think that's across the board. 
I don't think yeah. anyone's had a motor yet. I could be wrong, but I don't think anyone's had one motor that was like super great with 10 tooth. They put the 13 on and it was super great with a 13. Yeah. Not that I know of, no. you know, you know, it's funny because a lot of people who, who haven't attended one of the races yet, you know, they say, Oh, well that 10 tooth pinion, that's going to be so slow. Anybody can drive that. The cars will never fall off. Yeah, they fall. You know, you know e even at Tracy's, I don't think there was a single person that ran a perfect race with a tent, even with a ten tooth pinion on. No, you know? and I mean, like at Tracy's, the only perfect race was was me and 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 Terry Watson in the GTP race. R right. We both ran off the entire sixteen minutes, never fell off. Right. Um, I mean, I bumped uh, Bobby one time uh, on a restart. Right. And thought I came out, but I hadn't. But anyway, we both ran perfect races. And, and, you know, I finished, I don't know, he was a top turn. I was halfway down the straightaway. So it was a super close race, but we were the only two to run a perfect race that day. Yeah. And, and, and you know, back to the motors, <clears throat> I think for my LMP motor with a 10 tooth pinion, you know, I think I barely, barely made it eighth place qualifier to get right. in the A main. And I was like two tenths off the pole. Right. And the race started. And once the track got loaded up with eight cars, man, right. my motor, my motor just was far superior to everybody else's on a loaded track. Well, and that's another thing too. You that know? Donald doesn't tell you either. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's, that was my point. You know, right. there's just so many, there's so many variables, you know, you have gear ratio, final drive ratio, right. power band, track power, yeah, too well, many variables. You, know, that you just you can't replicate. You qualified bad, and we don't know why you qualified. Was that the motor thing or was that the car thing? But after two or three or four heats of racing, you run at a main, the track has changed. The traction's different. Right. So so maybe your motor run better because it, it, it ran better with the track being more sticky. You know, it's, right. it's, it puts a different load on the motor. So right. it's going to make the motor run different. Yeah. So also too, real quick, I know there's, there's a lot of people that are looking for the monster machine dinos. I just want to tell everybody that they can try searching some of the RC car forums or eBay. Yeah. Or eBay. Um, I've, I've bought two of them off RC car forums in the past. I bought them, played one for a little while and lost, lost interest, sold it and then bought another one and lost interest and sold it. So, well, mine, you know, I had to blow three inches of dust off it to use it as the prop here. So right, right. Because I just I I never really used it. I mean, like, you know, when we were when okay when when puppy dogs were the thing in retro racing, people wanted to know their RPMs on their motors, and they right. a lot of people didn't have machines. So I would spin their spin their motors and tell them what 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 had the most RPMs. Yeah, and, and ship them back to them. Also, too, it's it's worth noting that if you're looking for one of the monster machine dinos and you do find one used or on the RC car forum, you want to make sure it has the correct sensor for a two millimeter shaft. Otherwise, you're going to have to come up with some kind of way to make your own reading or whatnot. So, yeah, you might be able to, to sleeve it with a brass sleeve because right. it doesn't really matter because it's going to wobble anyway. I've never seen one that ran. Right. They all right. wobble like crazy. Right. It's a two millimeter on the two millimeter shaft. They like that. Yeah. But it's the sensor. And, and, you know, that's the thing about dinos too. You know, we talked about slave motor dinos and then we talked about dinos or you brought it up that the training machine only has the one sensor. So you can't, you can't manipulate loads by changing a, the size of the sensor Right. Now, on a dyno or an RPM checker, whatever you want to call it with a propeller. Yeah, a bigger propeller is going to be more of a load on the motor versus a smaller propeller. But, again, it's like I said, on a, on a monster machine, you should probably check your motors on 6 volts, 7 volts, 8 volts, or whatever. And then if you're going to do the propeller deal, you got to check your motor with all the different size propellers and probably through all the different voltage things before. And, again, right. until you stick them in the car on the track, you're not going to know what you have. Yeah, you just don't know. Yeah, it's Like I said <clears> – <throat> If if dinos were the hot thing for slot cars, we'd have had them for the last thirty or forty years. Right, everybody would be making one. Nothing has changed, you know. and I, and I think like I know Pro Slot. Pro Slot was involved in the Phantom Dino machine, and they sold them for a while. 
And, and the thing is with that, that is a great reference tool for them because that dyno does do everything you really want a dyno to do as far as RPMs and tor a torque and different things like that. So for development in their business, that's a great tool for them. Yeah. But I'm sure they would tell you we had motors that dynoed really good that were big turds on the track. Right. So, but I mean, if you're going to, if you want to, if you're developing a motor and you want to test different magnets or, or different armature winds or anything that you can change inside a motor and put it on and then change it and put it back on and see an RPM gain or loss, you know that whatever you're doing is having an effect. That's a great developmental tool. Yeah. But and I think with motors are still motor racing. You can't change things per se. Yeah. Especially with a retro Hawk motor or Hawk seven. You, there's nothing you can change unless you tear it apart, which is illegal to do. But I'm just saying now with pro FK motors, you can change your brush spring tension or change your brushes right. springs and, and see things. So teach his own. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying dynos are good. I'm not saying they're bad. Personally, I don't use one. I have never used one. I take all my motors to the track, and I plug them all in the car and try them. Yeah, Always same here. Always will. Yeah. But I think the important thing, too, is no matter what you're doing, and even if it's just breaking in your motors or if it's trying to get an RPM rating, you know, the, the end number is really irrelevant to anybody but you. You right. just want to make sure that, what you do, you do it consistently Correct. for, your, for yourself. You well, and, and like, okay, you just, sub, you, you just touched on a subject of breaking in motors. That's more important than anything. Right. Okay, and like everyone has their own secret way of breaking in Retro Hawk or Hawk 7 motors. Right. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how you do it. The end result is you want your brush to be fully seated around the commutator. Right. Okay, so... If, if you're running motor in for 12 volt or 12 hours at three volts or however some of these guys do it, or you water dip them, doesn't matter. Once you get the brush to be fully seated around the comm, you can run another 10 hours. It's not going to improve the motor. Right. Because that's the end game. You want that, you want that brush seat against the commutator. You want no arcing or, you know, I mean, they all arc, but the least amount of arcing that the motor does, the commutator and brushes, the cooler it will run and the longer it'll last. Yeah. So I know, I know for me, what I like to do, I do do the water break in and it is important to me to have the calm as clean as I can have it when the brush is fully seated. Right. You know? So Yeah. Cause like the retro Hawks that I've been doing, like breaking in for Terry or something or anybody sends me motors to, to break in or I tell them the same thing. I water dip them for about a minute. I just take, I get a clear solo cup, put water in it, stick the motor in it, turn it up to about five volts. And as soon as I can see the water start to become a little silvery, change of color, Yeah. motor out, blow it out. And I put on power supply for three hours at like five volts and just keep it oiled. And then right. go back with them. They're not, they're not going to get any better. Yeah. That's some pretty much the same thing. What I do, I've been doing this simple green thing where I let it run simple green for about 10 seconds and okay. then I'll take it out and I'll dip it in a cup of water just to kind of wash the simple green out. I'll let it run in the water for like 20 seconds and then I'll kind of blow it out, put right. it back on the power supply for like another 20 minutes and just let it just kind of clean itself up. And right. And, and like, and like, like the ProSod FK motors, you, in my opinion, you don't want to water dip them because they have a, they have a taller brush wraps around the com more than the smaller brushes, smaller common and the, and the retro Hawk motors. Right. The problem you have is when you water dip them, if you go just a little bit too long, you're going to clog up the slots in the commutator with brush dust. And basically it's a big short then. And the motor's not going to run and you can't really get in there to clean the crap out of there. So don't water dip ProSod FK motors. Get a radius okay. tool, knock the crust off the face of the brush, and you got to shorten the length up a little bit anyway. Put them in there. Like I tell everybody, Kofor Bigfoot brushes, Red Champion Springs, you just, they're going to run good. And, and the, the stock springs are fine on lower voltage, 13 and a half or lower. Anything over that, Red Champion Springs, because they won't collapse under heat. Yeah. And I remember back in the, back when we were running puppy dogs, 
we had a couple issues with, and I, I did had some issues with the springs collapsing, and yep. and I know I talked to you about it, and you you suggested a, I think it was a Coford spring at the time, the Coford three yep. coil. Well, Coford three thirteen yeah. will work. Three I mean, thirteen. That, that's yeah. a that's a heavier spring. It's designed for like open racing. We used to run them for years on open motors. Yeah. And um, it's just a different material that, that's very heat resistant. Yeah. Most of your springs are made from piano wire, just just like uh, you build a chassis with. There's different materials for, for more heat resistance out there. And Coford's is made from a different material than piano wire. So okay. it's got a higher heat resistance than probably piano wire. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, when I tested the, like the springs back to back to back, right. I couldn't tell a difference in how right. they ran from a stock spring to a champion light to a Coford. Right. But in the end, I could just tell that the Coford was better because I never had a problem collapsing. Right. Well, it's a reliability issue. Yeah. A problem or, or solution. So, I mean, like, like a champion red spring, I've never had one collapse unless I shorted the spring out against the chassis or something. Right. Yeah. I've never had one collapse. Okay. So, yeah, if you're doing pro slot FKs, like I say, go for Bigfoot brushes and and Red Champion Springs. And hopefully at some point, um, Pro Slot is, is, I don't know if it's a secret or not, but they are trying to come out with a better compound brush than they've had in the past. And hopefully they'll, they'll hit that and maybe that brush will even be better than the Kofor Bigfoots at some point. Yeah, I think I saw today they had a little press release about some new brushes they have, but I, I, if I recall right, they were for open motors maybe. Okay, I missed that, but I did see where um, yesterday, well, I think it was today, and well, I think there was two announcements today. One was new 16D quad magnets for like the drag racers, and the other one was uh, they're trying to get back into the game of uh, better scale uh, Eurosport type armatures. Yeah, that was the one I saw, but I was pretty sure there was something about okay. brushes in there too. I, the I could thing. be wrong. But anyway, yeah. you know, um, and that's a, that's another that's another show. I hopefully yeah. one of our guests one night will be John Miller from Pro Slot, and maybe he can tell us what's going on, what he's going to do, and because he's the new owner of Pro Slot here, the last I don't know six months or so. Yeah, John's a cool guy. He's got a pretty interesting background too. And oh, I, yeah. I'd really like to hear his opinion on now that he's um, not just a racer and he's a manufacturer like us and how he kind of mixes two together and sure. And, um, and another, just, another good guess would be Dan DeBello, the former owner, right. Who's been racing since the late sixties, early seventies and tons of history and knowledge there. And I, yeah. I don't know if we could get him on the show, but Hey, we can only uh, invite him and see what we can do. Yeah. So, so that is one thing we want to do guys is we want to try to have guests if not weekly, maybe bi-weekly sure. and we can have up to four people on here well, i think we so, have more than that but i think it might be confusing with more than right so if there if there's anybody that you guys want to see or if you have questions for myself or ron or for anybody else comment it ask us questions and we'll see what we can do you know yeah, and if you this and is if for you, you guys sure and if you have any questions of things you want to see us talk about um if you want to ask technical questions um anything Send us a message. Hopefully, next show and at the start of the show, we'll bring some of that stuff up. I mean, we'll probably have right. to clean up our unfinished business from this show next week because we'll probably get some letters about this show. But <laughs> then we could go on to new issues and try and solve those or answer your questions and go from there. Well, I got a got a couple of things here. Looks like this past weekend there was a lot of racing going on. I know they had the Summer Speed Fest in Tennessee. Um, Retro East is still going strong. They had their battle of the colonies. Yep. Um, and Jimmy Williams Jr. came away as the uh, governor of the colonies for the governor second year the in a row. Governor now. Yeah. Well, so we yeah. have. Uh, so let's see. We in the East Coast we have a governor. We have a Don. And uh, what, what what what's the guy is is the guy at the uh, fall brawl like the heavyweight champion then? Yeah, yeah, I think they call him just kind of the overall champion, yeah. Knockout King. One year they might have done boxing gloves, I think, maybe. Oh, that'd be yeah. cool. Yeah. Knockout King, I like it. And this coming weekend, 
there's going to be a lot of racing going on. Um, I know for myself, business-wise, the uh, summer slump seems to be coming to an end, and everybody's kind of yeah, everybody's kind of kicking off and getting going again, which is awesome. Yeah, dirt. It's gonna. It, the next thirty days are going to be very busy. We got lots of races to talk about. We'll have results to talk about. Um, who knows? Maybe some controversies to talk about. But every but most of the races go pretty smoothly. But yeah. But and there may be some funny things that we may hear about or see, and we'll have to share those with those who weren't there. Or, but yeah, I mean, um, yeah. And the, the next uh, thirty, well, actually, probably the next sixty days are going to be pretty busy because we've got races this weekend, the following weekend, the following weekend. The only weekend we got off between now. In the second week of September would be Labor Day weekend. I don't think there's any races on Labor Day weekend. Right. So. Well, I know this coming weekend, I know down in Florida, they have a uh, FSCS and GER combo race. That's on August 12th, Saturday at Key One Raceway, which is owned by Marcos, Marcos. Ramos. Yep. Um, the Division One Nats are coming up. That should be pretty good. Well, I, let's back up. This weekend is also the – FNRS race. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Durham, North Carolina. Yeah. And um, I think these two guys are going to be there. But, okay, Ralph. That's the plan you, anyway. <laughs> okay, well, you went down there a couple weeks ago and ran the warm-up race. Uh-huh. And, uh, well, tell us a little bit about that. I mean, I you know, we talked about it, but. Yeah, no, that was my first time there. And I could tell from the pictures that it was probably definitely not going to want to be someplace I wanted to show up at with no experience at a big race. Right. Um, it's a very awesome track. It's a driver's track. Um, Teddy Hoots and Pete Reams and Anthony and the guys down there, they really take care of the track good. Track was in super shape when we got there. Uh, clean, spray glued, power was great. The braid was great. No issues there whatsoever. And, man, I just got there, and I just started pounding laps and knocking the wall down you know, just, just trying to get that rhythm and that feel. And once I, once I kind of got going on, it kind of a little light bulb went off in my head. When I started racing about 15 years ago, I started on a 220 foot Engelman. Does that have it, a big hill in it? it? It Yeah. It had a hill on, on each end. S is in the straightaway. It had a high bank up here, a low bank down here. Okay. And, and the light bulb went off that, man, this track is exactly like that track. It's just shorter. And, have no hill right just don't have the hill and so w once i kind of once that registered i was able to kind of start flowing on a little bit better you and, know? and that track has a lot of history behind it because that track was once owned by lou Sacconi. yeah and, and if i remember right they had two amstra nats on that track yeah and i believe they might have had that at mark green's second usra scale nets in 2007 i think they used that track was that at the hotel? At the hotel, in yeah. In Philly, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think they used that track, and they used Mark's flat track. Yeah. They just moved them to the hotel. and So that track has a lot of history. And those Nats, like I said, well, I don't know exactly the year of the Amsra Nats, but the USRE Nats that that track would have been 2000. So that's 10 years ago. I mean, that track's been around. And, and, it's, it's, in, and it's in great shape still, too. Quite a history. And the TSR, the TSR guys down there, in North Carolina, they race there almost every month, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I think that this race this weekend will probably be the largest FNRS race to date. Yeah. Based on the support of the locals down there. Yeah, the Carolina guys, they really have a great monthly, um, oh, yeah. great monthly yeah. program. Wow. They got a couple different series. Yep. You know, they go back and forth between the Carolinas, and they got a pretty big core group. Yeah, because you, know, the, you got the Mid-South, yeah. and then you got the uh, Rebel Series. Right. So. They're like everybody else. They kind of bicker a little bit, but in the end, they all show up to race, you know. Got to have some bickering. Yeah. Ball busting, bickering, you know, shit like that. I mean, that's what, that's what we have fun doing when we go to the races. Yeah. I mean, I know there's going to be 10, 12 guys coming from – you know, like Georgia or Indiana, Ohio. You got people. Um, I heard people. Some people coming from New York, Pennsylvania. Yeah, that's what. That's the rumor. You know. So if you, yeah, I heard New uh, Jersey. Uh, I heard New Jersey. I heard Pennsylvania. 
Um, I think I think uh, maybe one or two from Maryland. Uh, might get some guys from Virginia from the track over there in Stoughton. Stoughton? Stoughton? Yeah, yeah. Stoughton, Virginia. And the South, you know, the Mid South and the Rebel guys. And um, other than that, I really don't know. A lot of guys don't announce they're going anywhere. They just show up. They just show up, yeah. So, I mean, a year ago, I, a year ago at the TSRA race there in August, they had like 27 to 30 guys in the three classes. So, if you have those guys plus another 10, 12, 15 travelers, it's going to be big. Yep. It could be, like you said, it could be bigger than the first two FNRS races, which were, then, which were yeah, awesome. Those, and those two races are nothing to slouch about. I mean, those were two yeah. turnouts for, you know, the first two races of this new deal. So Yeah. The A mains have been packed with heavy hitters, and there's yep. been close racing all the way to the bottom. Yep. You know, yep. It's been a lot of fun. So the next the next race this weekend is the Hillbilly Hard Body, Hard Body Nats at Slot Cars Are Us, America's fastest king track. Fastest king track in America. Yeah, I'm fastest in America, and it is a fast track. I mean, <laughs> it is, yeah. <laughs> it, it is is properly named because it is the fastest king track in America at this time. Yeah, I mean, and, and I know Tracy is expecting a pretty good turnout. For that race too yeah. right it's the fastest flexi car track that i know of it's the fastest wing car track it's the fastest retro track everything we've raced there has been i mean i've never raced on any king track that's as fast as tracy's track yeah and it's smooth too oh. you know it's just nice power stays good yep super smooth um, tracy tracy runs a good show it's a good place to race. Lots I, wonder of bars. I wonder if he's going to dress up like Fester this weekend and maybe have a light bar. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I'm surprised he didn't do a video for this, but all jokes aside, um, you know, the hard body thing has been really, I mean, I'm shocked at how, how big it has grown in a short time there at Slot Cars R Us and um, the other raceway there in Tennessee. So they've always had a good crowd at Bullet in Louisville, Kentucky. Kentucky, yeah. And I don't think there's much crossover between the two right now, but Tracy's done a tremendous job. I mean, what, they're racing three nights a week, hard body cars? And it's yeah. all nine-second breakout racing. And, you know, breakout racing, that's another subject for another show. <laughs> but uh, personally, I don't like breakout racing. But after watching what Tracy's done in such a short time, breakout racing is a good thing. I mean, I agree. Yeah, for new yeah. people, old people, um, it, it, but we'll talk about that on another show. Yeah, and what's cool? What's cool about the hard body deal is, do they want to race? Yeah, they want to race, but they also want those cars look awesome. They yeah. look so realistic, man. And here's what I'm going to tell yeah. you: I don't, I don't care what the cars, how fast they go, because they run a nine second breakout. I mean, that's like waiting for paint to dry on a King track that we're used to going three. The, yeah. Right. Three and a half seconds on. Okay. So like we're on three laps in the time they run uh, one lap. Okay. So, but the thing is, even if they're that slow, when you put eight of them on the track, you've got a race. Right. Yeah. There's always a race. No matter what the speed of the car is, you put eight of them on there in the same class or speed. It's a race. I always said, hey, if you, I'll, ra I'll race turtles if you want to line them up. We'll go right now. Well, <laughs> well you know? when I went to Belgium in 2000, like for the Millennium Race at J.P. Van Rossum's, we ran these 250-gram uh, play fit cars with some big honking Mabuchi motor, and they were super slow. But when we had six of them on the track, we had a hell of a race. That's right, yeah. You know, it was all yeah. about racing. Yeah. So. So, so they look good. Those guys get to race them three times a week, and you know, in that kind of in that Kentucky, Nashville, Western Tennessee area, I mean, they got they got a lot of guys that want to come race them. And so. another and another thing that's slow slow is that American Womp Racing Association. Like, yeah, they're having races everywhere with Womp Womps. Yeah, not not huge turnouts. I mean, not like you know twenty thirty cars, but it's almost like there's a, a resurgence in Womp racing. Yeah, and all that's kind of the AW, AWRA was kind of started by and led by Steve Atkins. Right. And man, he's done a hell of a, a hell of a lot of promotion. And that's another guest, you know, 
a lot, a lot of a lot of people laughed at the idea. I'm I'm not gonna lie, I laughed at it. You know, I, you know, I never. You know, heard but hey, it's taken off. It's good I for him. Good for the until, tracks. Well, I never heard of the idea until he's like, boom! Here's all these flyers for races. So, yeah. I didn't. I didn't laugh. I just thought, well, you know, they're trying to get Womps going. So, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's whatever gets the racers in the door to spend the money and keep the raceways open. You know, if, started, if, if you're a wing with, car guy or you're a flexi guy and and you hate hard bodies and Womps, that's fine. But it, you know. Right. One day that might be all there is, you know, so go while you can and spend money and keep the doors open. And I started with Womp Womps 36 years ago. And yeah, I, I've only raced, uh, well, we raced Womps pretty hot and heavy the first few years I raced and then nothing. Flexi car came out and that's where everybody raced. So right. uh, it was probably 15 years ago I raced, the last time I raced a Womp car. All right. Um, I don't know. It's just a different type of racing. So yeah, Different absolutely. Team. But they were fun. That's where I got my start. You know, speaking of, speaking of Tracy's Speed Bowl, um, you know, Tracy's going to hold the Nats, the Division One Nats next year. Yep, 2018. And I think it's interesting that, we you know, we got the Nats starting this weekend here at Frank's in California. That for the second year in a the row, there you are, C-Prop. Um the second the year in a row, it, it, it's on it's on a quote unquote driver's track, you know. So I think that's pretty interesting too. Yeah, they're going back about uh, fifteen years in time racing on that style of track. Yeah, compared to what they've compared to what they've raced on. I mean, the last time that you could say they went backwards. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but. You know, you've always got a progression of faster tracks. Every time a new track's built, it's faster than the than the other track. So, or hopefully, that's what they hope. Well, hopefully, anyway. yeah. so so the last time we kind of went back in time was in two thousand and three at Maryland, because all the tracks were faster, and we went back to like a slower track, right. and then been faster tracks ever since until this year. Now we're going, we're going back. Right. So, and and and. 2016, the Nats at Peachtree City, they were kind of like a small step back, but it wasn't not like this. Wasn't that year. much, but it's, yeah, it's not like this year. All right, right, because at Peachtree you could still run modern cars, short, light cars, low downforce bodies. This year, it's going to be longer chassis, maybe a little heavier, maybe some floating body mounts, and higher downforce bodies, and different tire compounds. I mean, you're probably going to have to go softer. And I suspect that regardless of the track or the type of setup you have, that the usual suspects will probably still be at the top. The cream always rises to the top. That's right. That's so, right. yes. So if you are listening to this and you are in the area of Frank's, even if you're not a wing car racer, you should stop by, check it out, pick yeah. up some braid, a couple sodas, as you call it, a couple pops. Pops. Check it out, hang out, spend a couple bucks, and support the raceway. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I think you're going to see a lot of people come out of the woodwork you haven't seen wing car racing for a long time. That could, that and there's could, a lot that of guys in the thing. California that haven't really raced, but now they're going to race because it's the Nats and everything. And, and hopefully after the Nats are over, they'll – because NorCal USRA does have a pretty decent little group going there, and hopefully right. they can build on this and, and go forward. Not many king tracks in – Northern California. I think there's just Frank. So yeah. in, in, I think in California, there's only two King tracks total. Him and Buena Park. Yep. And if I'm wrong, someone will write in and tell me, but <laughs> you're right. Cause the one that was South of Buena Park just recently closed. And I believe that track is for sale. That was, uh, I can't think of, I can't think of uh, the name of it, but it was, it was South of the LA area. Okay. So, Le Mans, Le Mans Raceway. Le Mans Raceway, yeah. Yeah. Okay, there, I couldn't think of the name of that one either. Yeah. Beautiful um, track. I mean, it looked great in the pictures, but they never seemed to get things going there, so. So, looking a little farther ahead in the future, August 19th is the ninth annual Columbus Aduro. Uh, you and I have both been to that. Yes, we and have. That's a, that's a pretty cool race. And then you got August 26th is going to be the Lee Watson Memorial Race. I have a prop. For that. I have a prop for that. Okay. One too. All right. And you guys are going to be running retro angle wire 
Retro angle winder, can am and F1 using BR, BRS rules yep. and then FNRS, <laughs> GTP. GTP, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, that, that'll be a, well, that's the BRS kickoff race for the season. Okay. And, um, and it also honors Lee Watson, who Lee Watson was a, a little background on Lee. He was a GM engineer from I think he started there in the 60s, traveled around a lot, got into slot cars. And and Lee is really well – Lee is more known in the drag racing deal than he ever was the road the road course deal because right. I think he did lots of road course racing back in the 60s and 70s. But then he really got into the drag thing. And, you know, in the Dayton area where he lived uh, for a long time, the only thing that was there was, was – uh, TR Motorplex or TR's raceway with right. drag strip. And he really, he really got into that. And, you know, he built a lot of record setting world record holding cars and motors and stuff. And he, uh, he raced with us a little bit in the, in the retro deal, can am and stuff. And then his health, his health deteriorated. And, you know, sadly he passed away three or four years ago. So, and Rick Blackson, the owner of, 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 well, former owner of Tr former owner of T R State. Yeah. <laughs> or no, T R T R Motorplex. There you go. Your Motorplex <laughs> has honored Lee since twenty thirteen or twenty fourteen by having okay. race yeah. in his name and having a special plaque made for the winner of the Can Am race. Yeah, I'm excited because I get to go to Tri State, formerly T R Motorplex, for the first time later this year. So I'm pretty pretty pumped yeah. about doing that. October twelfth or fourteenth, somewhere in there. Yeah, it's in October. Yeah, that'll be FNRS race number four. Number four. And speaking of um, slot car racers and good friends that have passed away, there's another memorial race coming up, and I believe you may have a prop for that also. I do have a prop for that, and this would be September 9th. Okay. It's the Legends Memorial at Mid-America, and the Legends Memorial is basically honoring five racers that have passed away in the, in the last few years, and it's Dave Fiedler, San Dave, everybody knows San Dave, Jay Kisling, everyone knows Jay Kisling, um, Ray Price, Chicago area racer that a lot of people know him around the country, Yeah, Jimmy Bostrom, which was uh, more of a Chicago local racer. He went to the first, first one or two R4s, and mm -hmm. um, Bob Oaks and Bob Oaks was at the first Sano I know, and I wasn't at the second Sano, so I don't know if he was at the second one, but uh, I think he was at the third one. And you weren't at the second Sano. I was not at the second Sano. Okay, okay. Didn't wasn't feeling well. Okay, I think Jake Hisling was there. Jake Hisling, yeah, Jake there. Hisling was the little history. Jake Hisling won the Coupe race the first three Sanos. Yeah. And then I won the next three Sanos. So I dethroned Jay and cause, cause Jay, Jay wanted to keep his streak going, but yeah, he was on a nice little run there as a, on. as the King of the Kings, as they called them. King of the Kings. So anyway, so yeah, so that race and they're going to, we're going to run, um, Yuska four and a half inch stock cars. And then we'll run, um, the B and E, or maybe it's the Mid America Hard Body Series Super Stock Class. Mid American, yeah. And then uh, Retro Can Am and FNRS GTP. And four and a half will be on the Oval at Mid America. Uh, the Hard Bodies will be on the LTD, which LTD track, which was Dave Fiedler's track that he had at his raceway when he was bus in business in Chicago. And then Can Am and GTP will be on the King track. Yeah, I think that's awesome that that was able to be kept around and maintained and still in the Chicago area, you know, all these years. I think well, yeah, because cool. Dave you know. sold it to Lucky Bob in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And Lucky Bob, I don't think, ever set it up. He just had it in storage. And I think they said thir it was in storage for 13 years. Yeah. And I think Roger awesome. contacted him about buying it, and they didn't want to sell it. And – in the last six months, they negotiated something because now it sits at Mid America. So, so you got Sano Dave's LTD 
at yeah. Mid America, and then over at Chicagoland, you got the Fiedler Flat Track, Fiedler which, flat track. which he uh, won a lot of races on. Yeah, so because because cool. Sano Dave became Sano Dave because he won the first Sano race, right? And at the first Sano race, it was it was unique and different from all the other ones, I believe, because we ran a couple classes on the King and a couple classes on the road course or the flat track. And then there was an overall points deal. The top eight guys ran a final race on the flat track. And I don't know if that was to determine the overall champion of the event or whatever, but yeah, it was the Sano Dave cleaned our clocks. And that was done the second year also. Okay. I don't, I don't remember the third, but my if you're after, listening, that was a cool format, by the way. You and I think it ended after the second, the second year. Okay. You know, I went to third year and there was no overall points deal. Okay. Yeah. Cause I was at the second one, which was my first one. And right. there was a, a points deal. It was, a, it was pretty cool for me. Cause I just started retro racing and, and I made like the final showdown race on the flat track, you know? So right. I was in way over my head against all the legends. So it was awesome. And then the second year, did you not win the JK spec class? Uh, yeah. I don't remember what year that was. Okay. Maybe that was Sano four. Well, that'd been the year Something. after three. Okay. Yeah. Four. And then maybe, I don't know. Would Howie win three? Maybe Howie won the third one? The or did you race? win the third one? Yeah, the spec race. I think I won the second spec race. Okay. I don't remember who won the third, third one. See, the year you won, I think it might have been limited to drivers. The year that I won, they split it up. They had two classes of spec cars, I think. No, that yeah, was the third. That, that, you're that thinking of spec and super spec. That was the third year. The second year I won, because we used uh, Hawk 7 motors as a handout motor with a seven-tooth pinion, I believe. All right. To slow them down. And then the following year was when we had spec and super spec, and they split them by drivers. Yeah. And Wes, famous, world famous Wes, Wes P. from Speed Zone won that race. Okay. That was the controversial race there with the motor banging and cans <laughs> and people getting yeah. disqualified and somebody getting banned and, you know. Did, we should come up with a nickname for that race because it, it always gets brought up through time. You know, we got to have some kind of like, uh, you know. Yeah, I don't know. Some, can't squeeze gate or something, you know, I don't know. <laughs> sneaky Sano, they wasn't so sneaky, I don't know. Pound by pound – that was the best Sano ever. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so, yeah. That was a pretty good Sano, though. Actually, there's a lot of people at that one. I remember the competition was, was pretty hard. That was one of the best year. ones because, like, yeah, I mean, yeah. you had yeah, you had a lot of guys there. You had um, – And then you had, like, Chris Jay. Barnes, Chris Barnes Jay, came up from Georgia, and you had Jay there. And Matt and Wes and Matt, Mike yeah, Isles was Mike there. Isles. And yeah. uh, you, Randy, Howie, Terry was there that year. You were there. Yeah, and a lot of guys. Uh, San O'Day was there. Ray Price was yeah, there. Yeah, you know what? I think that might have been – if that wasn't the biggest year for Can-Am, it was the second largest yeah. turnout that year. Yeah. Yeah, because I believe Dave Gearing won the GTP handout race in Coops. And I won Puppy Dog um, – can, a puppy dog coop. And I think that might have been the year that I, I qualified in the B main for F1. I won the B main and won the A main. And I want to say Howie or Matt won can I never won a Can-Am race there. So. That was that was the year that Howie just, just smoked everybody in Can-Am. Was it? I, okay. Yeah, I guess I, I remember we started the two-minute warm-up, and Howie starts on red, the slowest lane. And we all take off for the warm up, and Howie's lapped us from red in like three laps in the warm up. Where it's like, okay, well, Howie's had Howie's we'll race for a second. Yeah, well, Howie's had some good Sanos. I mean, not consistent, but I mean, he does every maybe every other year he wins something, and so he usually wins it kind of big. So yeah, I think that year he, I think that was um, he had that Richie Austin car that year. If yeah, 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 yeah. Because that was the year that I didn't finish the race. Yeah, uh, I think you you got bellied or Marshall. Yeah, I got bellied. The top, the top maybe, turn, you know, maybe. Yeah, well, it it wasn't done on purpose. It just no, happened. yeah, no, yeah. It's yeah, a racing yeah, deal. It but, happens, yeah. But and we and me and John Miller actually just talked about that the other week. But and he still feels bad about it. But 
You know, I didn't like, even know it was John. I just, I just remember. He was marching the top turn, and he bent over, and <laughs> mesh, and because the soft wall just, and I was right. on the lane. So, right. But then the last year I was there was the year Howie won F1 and drove the perfect race. Yeah. In F1. Yeah. And uh, I, I don't think he – now, he didn't win. I think Matt won Can-Am because Howie just won one class. Okay. But Howie did win a couple Can-Am – Can-Ams, I'm pretty sure. And when it gets close to the Sano, we'll, maybe we'll talk about yeah. more Sano history. We'll have to break out the record books. Hey, we might have to have Mike Swiss on as a guest. Yeah. Yeah. So – that's you know, his race. He started it. I mean, that race has a lot of history. So, and this will be the eleventh year. Yeah, eleventh year, and I think he's on his third location, maybe yeah. third location. Yeah, third I've location. Been, yeah, I think I think I've been to one race, uh, at least one in each location. Yeah, maybe so, we can get, maybe we can get him to stop the birthday party long enough to uh, come on the show. <laughs> You know, blow the candles out. <laughs> he has a new um, wing car chassis out. I heard this one, that seems to be pretty good. A lot of a lot of those guys up in the Chicago area have been running it. Like, yeah, I think I think it's a Group F chassis. Yeah, a box stock yeah. Group F chassis. Yeah, and I think it's probably more designed for his track than the Super Speedways. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Because the if if I remember right, the picture I seen has weights up on behind the front bumper mm-hmm. and all the current box stock cars and group F cars don't have any weights, but super speedway. And I don't think Mike's trying to to sell something that has to be submitted to the USRA for approval and all that stuff to be legal. So, yeah, I think he's just kind of trying to have something for his guys to right. have fun with right. an affordable chassis that works good on his track. And yeah, I think that's, you know, I think what he was going for, he, he kind of hit the nail on the head there. Um, so, good for him. Yeah, and another another new item I saw that looks pretty interesting to me is that paw braid, and I haven't tried any, but I know some people who have, and they say they like it. Okay, I haven't haven't seen it anywhere yet. So, um, and it's just getting in the pipeline, I'm sure, because I mean it's been summertime. He just came out with it, what three four weeks ago. So by the fall, it'll be at your local raceway, I'm sure. So. Yeah, from what I know about it, it is 408 strand, okay. which for people who don't know, that's pretty much the standard. Um, that's what Parma Big Mama is, 408 strand braid. Right. It's the same thickness as Parma Big Mama and Prime. It's the same length. It has a pre-bent and dimpled clip. And the good thing about it is it's half the price of the Parma braid. So I know over the last couple of years, that's – that's one of the things I look at every time I go buy braid. I'm like, Ooh, how much is it going to be this time? You know, well, yeah, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it, but I I'm going to make a guess. And I'm going to, I'm thinking that that's probably the old Ferret engineering braid, or maybe it comes off that machine. Cause that was okay. the, that machine and, and process was last known to be in Florida. So okay, the Paul, the Paul thing is out of Florida. So okay, that's going to be my guess, but, and it doesn't matter where it comes from, but right. And then, and if it is the old um, Ferret Engineering braid, it's good braid because more history for you. George Hawk, the guy that uh, owned Ferret Engineering, years ago worked for Cobra Engineering, and George built three braid machines back in the '60s. And one of those machines uh, currently resides in Ohio. The second machine went to Maryland years ago, and the hasn't made braid for probably 25 years. And I don't know, really know. Well, the third machine, I think, stayed at Cobra. So um, when George got back into uh, slot racing and making stuff in uh, the 90s, he created Ferret Engineering, came out with a couple of chassis and ready to run cars and brought braid back. So he just went and made a new braid making die and got a punch press and started making braid again like he had done – you know, 20 years earlier, 30 years earlier. So, but George passed away a long time ago and um, his wife was continuing Ferret Engineering for a while. I think his wife and his son. And um, then they kind of fell off the map and no one had heard from him. 
Okay, so here's a trivial question since you're the uh, resident old guy on the show here. Old guy. Old How much guy. was a pair of braid when you started racing? Um, when I started in 1981, 360 braid was 35 cents and 408 braid was 45 cents a pair. Wow. Okay. And there was no big mama braid. Well, <laughs> yeah, there was, but Parma didn't sell 408 braid at the time because – Back then, basically, there was only three companies. Well, there was four companies making braid back in the early 80s. And, and Cayman was one, which was an old ferret machine or Cobra machine. REH, an old Cobra machine. Um, a company called Make All in California, which was making 408 braid. They originally made the braid for Riggin. When Riggin hmm. went out of business, okay. that that local tool and die shop that made the braid continued to make it and sold it OEM to speed sport distributing. I think Sonic products at way back when, and one other company. And then over time, other companies found out or those companies told other companies where we buy the braid. So Parma bought from that company, other company and came and made their own braid, but like alpha and Coford and, um, a few other companies, they bought braid from Associated. Associated had their own braid making machine. So you had soft 408 braid and you had hard 408 braid because the difference is it's, it's 408 strands. Right. But the way that the picks and the weaves is what makes the difference in the stiffness of the braid. Right. So even one company says mine's 408 and this is 408. They're two, they can be two different braids and back then and up until this day now okay associated they quit making braid a few years ago they sold their braid machine and everything but it was broken i heard it wound up in the trash can don't know if that's true or not but most all your 408 braid now is is the softer 408 braid and um goo goo red fox has a 408 braid it's really very stiff so, um, and then JK has 408 braid. It's made in China, but it's on a soft, I mean, it's softer than the soft stuff. I have, I've had no good luck with that. Yeah. I haven't had any luck with, with the, um, stiff goo goo stuff or the, yeah, yeah. Or the yeah. soft JK. Goo goo's is too stiff. Every time I've tried it, it might be okay for wing cars, but for scale type cars, it's been too stiff. The All JK right. stuff, which would be really good for flat track Eurosport cars that's that's real soft that's perfect for those cars but right for the majority of us racing on banked hill climbs and kings and we want that 408 that's in the middle we want that prime or that the big mama, mama or that reh um and pause a question mark i have no idea what it is because i haven't seen it we all want that big mama what can we say <laughs> you know big mama's it, it's it's really it's always been good braid when it's been available yeah. So, yeah. but yeah, cool. I mean, going from 45 cents a pair to $2 a pair. Right. And, 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 you know, the thing is, and Bob Haynes told me this years ago, he said, you know, the braid price has been the same for the last 20 years. It's never went up. And he says, we should have raised it a nickel a year, but copper stayed stable in price for many years and brass did. And, um, you know, I think if you if you took 1981, you went to a uh, inflation calculator, and you put in 35 cents in 1980. What is that in 2017 dollars? It's probably close to two bucks a pair. Yeah. But the problem was because we didn't adjust it over time. When it went from a dollar a pair to two dollars a pair overnight, everyone had sticker shock. It, it was a big shock. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I remember well, back when I started racing, uh, tires were four dollars a pair for like alpha tires, quality tires were $4 a pair. And we bitched about the price of $4 a pair for tires. Yeah. The wing car race. Now you're paying 20 plus dollars a pair to wing car race. Well, from what I heard, the paw braids supposed to be somewhere around $1.25 a pair. Okay. So that'll be nice. Cause uh, you know, these days, not that many things actually comes back down in price. price. <laughs> so right. that'd be cool. Give, I'd give it a try anyway. So oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'll try it. I mean, it could be the it could if it's just as good as the other stuff that I'm using. 
yeah, I, I'm, I like saving money. Who doesn't? <laughs> but the thing is, you know, the thing is, over time, they're going to probably have to raise their price. I mean, we, we don't know the situation there. I mean, maybe they bought 300,000 pairs sitting there. It was made 20 years ago, and they're repackaging it. Right. But yeah, when it I comes to replacement costs currently, maybe it'll go up, maybe it won't. We'll see. I mean. Yeah, who knows? But, but you know, with, with Mark at Prime passing away, there was a problem getting Prime Braid for a while. Now it, Now it's back. I don't know if the price changed, but it's back. It's available. It's good mm -hmm. braid. Parma has been spotty at times. Um, REH, no one really knows about REH braid, but um, it's out there. Tracks can get it. It's usually sold under the generic label. I think ERI. It, will sell that's it. just the 360 strand though, right? Well, they sell a generic 4, uh, 408 too. They do? Okay. Yeah. And I believe uh, not too long ago I bought some of that at uh, Thaser Raceway in South Bend, and I think it was a dollar and a quarter a pair or something. So it, it was a lot cheaper. Cool. Okay. I think it was. It was, it was definitely cheap. It was a dollar something, and it was quite a bit cheaper than, like, the $2 braid. Well, when we when we get a little more fancier, we'll have to, like, flash, you know, like, flash Thaser's phone number on the screen so he can, he can sell thousands of pairs of braid overnight. Yeah, well, now everybody's going to be looking for paw braid. Well, you know, and, and, if you're, try. and you, and you know, for this free advertisement, you can always send in samples or <laughs> some, some form of payment to me and Ralph and, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll further your uh, advertising opportunities here on the show. Yeah. H E I and R T R world headquarters. <laughs> so, well, that's, that's pretty much all, all I saw, um, you know, this, this week in the, in the headlines, as they say. In the headlines. And then tomorrow will be a new headline. And we'll have to wait till next week. But but maybe we can have a special show if something really big crops up. Yeah. Well, the headline could be, uh, you know, new slot car talk show flops. You know, you never, you never know. So <laughs> we, could be the, we could be the headline or the punchline. Well, I think we're going to do this no matter if we have two, li two watchers, listeners, or whatever. Right. And we'll just do it and right. take it for what it's worth. That's right. It's like free advice. We're just having yeah. fun. <laughs> We're just having fun. Because it's funny because, you know, like I told you before, me and me and Randy had always talked about doing the Ron and Randy show. Right. Years ago, and it would be more like an audio show, and it never happened. So, you know, it would be like a radio show, but it never happened. And, you know, now with the technology of having, being able to do the video and everything, yeah, we could do audio podcasts. And, like, Got to tip a hat to Tracy Brown again. He did a podcast, what, about a year ago? Well, you know what? It was more than a year ago because he started the podcast. I think it was on Thursday night. I think it was an hour long. And it was one of those deals you had to tune in, or I felt I had to tune in because you never knew what Tracy was going to talk about or who was going to be on the show. Right. It was it was just like a soap opera. Not You never knew what was going to happen. Yeah, you, yeah, you didn't want to miss it. So, right. So, Tracy did that for, I think, three episodes, and, and then he got the king. The king track was coming, had to take out the old track, put the new, and the podcast never came back. And the podcast was cool, but I think adding the video, the visual, makes it a lot better. Right. So. Yeah, I like Tracy's, and, you know, honestly, I mean, a, a lot of people laughed about it or, or joked about it, but, you know, no, like, I, you, like you said, I mean – at least Tracy had the balls to go out there and do it and give sure. it a try. And I mean, it was more of a polished you know? production with some intro music and right. he would maybe, take breaks and, you know, maybe someday we'll, I don't know if we'll take breaks, but maybe we'll have some fancy intro music and we'll get some graphics up here on the, on the screen or something, but he had the, yeah, uh, the 10 cent network in charge. Yeah. Well, this is a low rent rent deal right now. Yeah. So we're just having fun and, or the, th or the three cent production here. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully we're at two cent. <laughs> two cent. There's two guys. We got a penny each. But, um, <laughs> you know, two guys, and um, we're having fun. And uh, hopefully we make you laugh and make you think, and and maybe want to ask questions or, you know. Yeah, definitely, guys. If you see this video posted on Facebook, like it, share it, comment on it. Ask us questions. Help us come up with a name for the show. Whatever you think of, 
just comment it. And then as far as the show, I mean, we're going to try to keep them to one hour or less. Um, unless there's really some night we really have a lot to talk about. It could be longer. But, yeah, we're looking to do basically an hour maximum length show. And tonight's probably, tonight's probably going to be a little shorter because we just don't have a lot to talk about. And, you know, maybe at some point we'll be able to take call-ins. I mean, you could probably message me or Ralph on Facebook. Probably message Ralph because I have a hard time keeping up with stuff right now. You could send a message on Facebook if you have a question, and we might be able to answer it on the current show. And, uh, and if not, we'll do it the following week. And you might give us a great yeah. thing, a great interesting thing to talk about. Maybe we'll want to invite them on the show. Well, and you know, like, know, there's a lot of people, the sky's the limit as who can be on the show as guests as far as there's people I want to see come on the show. There's people Ralph wants to come see on the show. And there's, you're going to have people you want to see on the show. So um, there's a lot of interesting people and players in this deal over the years. And I think the more of them we can get on here and talk to, um, you know, who maybe, who knows, next week we might have the uh, FNRS winner as a guest or maybe the hard body national champion as a guest or, you know, in the next week or two. Yeah. We, we'll try and get some of them people on here. And there's, there's just a lot of people in the hobby that have um, a lot of history and right. we may know of them or we may know them, but sometimes no matter how much you think, you know, people, you really don't know the person. Right. And it, it depends on, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of stories yep. that to share. You know, oh, there's of tons cool of stuff. history, tons of funny stories. Um, the biggest thing that's missing in the industry is a monthly magazine that we had for years. I mean, that's how we got our news and got backgrounds on people. And, you know, you go to races and meet these people and you get to hear their side of stories and talk to them and, and learn from them and learn about them. And uh, there's really not been any um, avenue for that the last several years. So, yeah, I know, I know as a teenager when I started racing, Man, I, I, every week I went in the saw car shop. Did you get the new magazine yet? Did you get the new magazine yet? You yeah. know, it, it you might have been waiting six weeks back then for the new magazine. Right, but but then you had but then you had on the cover, you know, it's like Ron Hirschman, Mike Swiss, Buf, and you know, oh, as a kid, and or, yeah, Chickarella. I'm looking, I'm like, oh man, like one day I want to race against these guys. Or, <laughs> you know, I mean. Okay, so now you're racing. It was awesome. You know? So you race with us now. Now what do you think? Well, I don't know, you know, but. Well, say it. We're just a bunch of assholes or? <laughs> no, you know, actually, I mean, really, it, it's kind of cool looking back on it. I mean, I almost say it's, I don't know if I should say it's surreal or not, but um, for me, it's really cool. I mean, I remember the time, the first time that I met you. I remember the first time I met and race against guys like Mike Swiss and Jay Kissling and Matt Bruce. And I mean, all those guys that, you know, you see about and you read about sure. and you hear about, you know, I mean, right. I, I, I remember racing against all those guys for the first time after reading about them and seeing them and hearing about them all those years, you know? Right. Well, and you know, when I started, like when I started the, the, uh, I started in 81, late 81, and Scale Auto Racing News was, had only been out for a couple of years. I think they started in 78 or 79. Um, not, not tons of race coverage because back, okay, <laughs> going back into things, when, back then when we went to races, we didn't have digital cameras and we didn't have cell phones to take pictures of stuff with. We had, you had to carry a camera, take pictures, then get paid, paid money to have them developed and then send them to the magazine. And, and right. the magazine depended on people to do that. Problem was there was, there wasn't enough Indians to do that. Are people at races willing to take those pictures and spend that money and mail those pictures off? Right. So, but like when I started racing, I mean, the magazine, the magazine only came out uh, maybe six times a year. And it only covered the big races. Right. And, and like, you know, back, Scale Nats, Division like back Nats, then Paul Pfeiffer like was that. king of Group 7 racing. You know, like right. he won three nationals in a row. He'd won three world championships in a row. But, you know, then there was guys like John Laster and, and uh, 
you know, Swiss was just starting to race pro and come up. So, you know, Swiss, you know, I don't, you know, each, each person is different on how they look at their peers or who they want to go race with and beat. But we came up in a different generation. So as we race those guys, then, you know, guys like yourself and Matt Bruce, they came behind. And so we replaced those guys. It's just like a leapfrog. Change, changing of the guard almost. Yeah, definitely sort changing of the guard. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah. And, you know, I can only name about five people that I know have raced kind of nonstop since the 60s. You know what I mean? Like, there's a lot of guys racing in the 60s. They took time off in the 70s or 80s, and they've come back. Mm-hmm. There's, there, and there, you know, there's guys that race 60s, 70s, took the 80s off, and they came back 90s. And so, so, you know, a guy like Pfeiffer, he started in the late 60s. He's always raced. He's raced in every decade since. Right. Uh, Tori Anderson's another one. Um, um, George Kimber from the UK, I, I, he may have raced since the 50s, okay, but he has raced nonstop since the 60s. I don't, I don't know right. if George ever taken off any time. And, um, hmm. you know, there's a few more. But wow. you take a guy like P.A. Watson, he started in the 70s, but he's raced nonstop since the 70s. Right. But he wasn't, he wasn't there in the 60s per se. Right. So, you know, and like, you know, I know, I know Mike Swiss started in the early 70s. I don't know if he actually raced in the 60s, but if he did, um, you know, you can. There's a there's a difference between I've I've been racing since the 60s nonstop, and then there's a difference between I've been winning since the 60s up to the, today. And there's just yeah. a handful of guys that have won in every decade since the 60s. All right. You know, I mean, it's a would, huge accomplishment. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and there, but it's just a few guys. You know, it's not like there's 50 of these guys. You know, I mean, slot racing's fun. Um, it's rewarding. It can be rewarding. Depends on where you take it to. It can be aggravating as hell. Yeah, it can be aggravating as hell. It can be expensive as hell, and it yeah. can cost you. It can cost you a marriage, or a, cost you a lot of things besides money. Yeah. But the whole thing is. Um, some people just aren't, and I'll say serious, but I think a lot of people just get so much enjoyment from it yeah. that they just keep doing it because they, they just get a satisfaction out of it that you can't, ex, can't explain it's, to some people. And some people get different satisfactions. It's cost me jobs, tens of thousands of dollars, relationships, <laughs> and I don't even care. I wouldn't, if, if I could go back and do it, only thing I'd do different is I would have raced a whole lot more. <laughs> Yeah, I have no regrets either. I mean, yeah. I mean, it didn't cost me a marriage, but I mean, but at the same time, I mean, you know, I put food on the table, so it was like, it was, it was, it was cool. To, you know, that's right. what I have to go do it. So, right, that was that was a fortunate thing. It became my job. What started right. as my hobby became my life. Right, because I've been consumed with it ever since. Same here. And I never right. had a game. Same. I never had a game plan that. You know, I started racing, and I'm like, okay, I want to, I want to own a company someday, or I want to work for a company. Then I want to own a company. And it was never, I never. It just, it just things happen. They just fell into place and yeah. right place, right time. And that's, that's exactly the same thing here. You know, uh, t- years ago, if, I would have never thought I'd be making slot car parts for a living. You right. Know? I mean, right. I didn't, pl- I didn't plan that. That wasn't, that wasn't my goal. But yeah, it's like people say. It, it happened and I love it, you know? Yeah, people say, well, that's your full-time job? <laughs> yeah, I get that all the time. No, no, really, but what else do you do? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know how to do anything else. I used to sell vacuum cleaners and repair vacuum cleaners. I could always go back to that. But, I mean, I could sell insurance. I could do anything, I guess, if I had to, but right. I have to. So I keep doing slot cars. Right, yeah. So Ride the wave as long as you can, man, you know? Yes, I, I guess. I'm not trying to set any longevity record, but – I'm going to keep doing it as long as I have fun and I'm having fun. And, um, yeah, I want to win when I go racing. I mean, like I always say, everybody wants to beat me and I want to beat everybody. So that, that levels it, but I go and have fun. And, and if I don't win, it's not the end of the day. I mean, 10 years ago or 20 years ago or something, yeah, it might've been, but I appreciate everything that, that I do. And I, I, I'm, I'm blessed with, I mean, Again, changing of the guard, you know, 
guys are going to be faster than me. They're going to outbuild me. They're going to outrun me. So it, it happens. Yeah, there's you know there's a lot of guys that race for <clears throat> for a couple of years or for twenty years or thirty years, and you know what? Like they never win a race. Oh yeah, but, but they're completely okay with it. Right. And they have so much fun, and right. I admire that because being youthful semi-youthful still you know I, i'm always i want to win you know well, i want to win i want to win and 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 when i look at, when i don't win i have fun but i'm upset i didn't win well and then i and then i see these guys and they've never won and they've had like three times as much fun as me right and i admire that i think that's awesome you know but, but the thing but the thing is that's the difference between the hobby and the sport and people you see the question come up especially on Facebook, a lot later. Is this a hobby or is this a, hobby a sport? Is, a sport? is it a hobby or a sport? Yeah. It's both, okay? Because like, <laughs> like my thing is if, if you just go and play with slot cars at the track and you don't race, that's a hobby, okay? Right. And if you start racing locally, now you're bordering hobby sports. But when you take time off of work and you go to the slot car races that are two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine days long – and spend a week's vacation there and, and two mortgage payments on your house to be there, now you're in the sport of it. Right. Okay? Yeah. That, that's no longer a hobby. That's a sport because <laughs> you're there for the competition. And in my opinion, competition is sport. I think I even saw recently somebody was, was talking about wearing a, a heart rate monitor while they were racing. Oh, really? You know? Yeah. So I, that would be interesting to see how that kind of goes. I've seen yes. guys where, I see guys wear monitors or something to, to jolt them if they have a problem. I'd like to put a, a, a heart rate monitor on Al Rudy, though. Well, just don't put the moisture meter on Al Rudy. <laughs> yeah. It's going to peg out. But you don't need to put one on him because we already know. Yeah. He, he's like – he's level 10 times 10. He, get, he goes at it. Oh, he is – Okay. Now, now you know, you get Brian another term intense. There, I don't think yeah. there's anyone more intense than Al Rudy. No, when it comes to squeezing the trigger. No, definitely or not. Pushing the trigger with his thumb. Yeah. And I mean, and Al's been racing a lot of years, you know. Oh yeah, I mean, yeah. There's another he's, guest. Yeah, he's still yep. winning races, having fun. Yep. Hey, a win's a win with Al, whether it's a C main or a B main, but. That's right. A win's a win. You still got to beat the other guys in that race. So, yeah, I mean, Al, Al's been Al's been a ton of fun for twenty plus years. So, yeah, he's won. You know, he's won a lot of stuff, and he'll tell you all about it too. <laughs> and not be bashful. <laughs> That's right. Because if we have him, if we ever have him on here, he'll have to show us his chart. He's got a chart. Oh yeah. That he okay. Dave Swerk can tell you all about, all about the chart. Okay. Where those, the, two, those are the two guys we need to have on the show. Yeah. Time, Dave and Al. Shadow and Al, yeah. Okay. They, they'd be funny side by side because they'd be their own show. We wouldn't even have to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you could just sit here and, and just laugh and, and poke them with a stick. So, yeah. Lots, lots of people can be on here. Okay. Well, hey, you know what? For our first show, I had fun. No one's yeah. throwing a tomato at me yet. Yeah, no, same here. We're good. We're good. <laughs> no, I had a lot of fun. I mean, yeah. I, I think this has a lot of potential, and we could really have a lot of cool guys on the show and, and really unearth some, some pretty cool history of our, of our hobby slash sport. Hobby slash sport. You know, and there, and there is some, you know, there are some uh, uh, hobby things that are hobby type people we can have on here too. I mean, I know there's an, another new book coming out. Uh, oh, yeah? Yeah, well, the long-awaited book, we've all been waiting for the second book. Who knows when that's going to happen. But <laughs> there's another new book coming out. Yeah, from not PDL. From Yes, from not the initials PDL. Okay which I always joke and say that'll be called uh, Slots, Lies, and No Videotape. So, uh, but the other book is going to be, a, I think, more of an informative book. Maybe not so much about the history, 
but more about maybe the players. But okay, when that when that hits, we'll we'll let the world know about this book, and then maybe uh, get the author of that book on here. And I, I think he'd be more than happy to probably be on here. And I think he's an interesting person. I've, I've messaged back and forth with him on some things, but we've never had a discussion. So no better place mm-hmm. to have a discussion than right here. There you go. On a uh, Wednesday night or Tuesday night. Okay. Well, we're taping on Tuesday. It'll probably be up on Wednesdays. And that's liable to change. Yeah, you never know. We're due just going to wing it. Due to our hectic Who knows? personal schedules, we will have to. We're going to try and do this every week. And uh, I guess we're going to try and be out on every Wednesday. So uh, You have to uh, coordinate with my assistant because my. My slot car superstar lifestyle gets a little crazy, you know. Well, you have your people call my people, and we'll <laughs> we'll, we'll just work it out from there. Yeah, <laughs> make this happen. So, um, I don't know what else to say, but yeah. anybody and everybody that's going racing this weekend, good luck, have fun, be safe. Um, and if you're going to the FNRS race and you happen to see this, come up and talk to us. Tell us what you think, good or bad. And if you want advertising, bring those dollars. That's right. You leave the rotten fruit at home, but, you know, don't throw it at us. And hopefully, you know, like, hopefully we might be able to do some live reports or something from the track this weekend. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Um, it's always a hectic, it's always a hectic day at the track by the time you tech three classes of cars and run three classes of cars and keep that show rolling to everybody get out of the door as early as possible, so... Yeah. Um, I know, I know I always say that oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then it's, well, you know, and, once you get, once you get to the track, it's, it's well, okay. Well, I just do that tonight. And then, and then you leave the track at 1030 and you eat and then it's like midnight. You're like, oh, okay, we'll do it tomorrow night. And then yeah. tomorrow night comes and you're well, like, I've had it for the weekend. Well, the problem is we go to race. So right. things that we want to do get put off the side. Right. And, um, and then again, that was like I said back in the early days of magazines. Everybody went to race not to take pictures, right? So, yeah, there's a lot of stuff missing. And I've seen some people's personal photo collections. They have like killer photos that no one ever seen. So, huh? And I'm actually trying to obtain some from a friend of mine that went to a lot of early's um, '80s Midwest USRA races and lots of famous. I mean, Pfeiffer and. Swiss and the PK guys and uh, Gottfried and Mayer and you know I'm saying names here a lot of people won't know but those were the heroes of the time and um, the pioneers of the sport yeah somehow yeah I mean yeah I want to get this collection and get some copies made and put them up on Facebook and you know just interesting stuff interesting stuff all right well a, a lot more time has passed than I thought would. So I had a blast. I appreciate you guys. If any of you guys are still around at this mark, <laughs> you guys are awesome. <laughs> so, so, if, so if you stuck around to the end of the show, the secret yes. word is goodbye. That's right. So just type goodbye and we'll know you watched the whole show. <laughs> there you go. But with the All show, right. You yeah. know, with the show being uploaded to YouTube, you can watch it whenever you want. Yeah. Like I said, uh, hopefully every every Wednesday at 8 o'clock, 7 or 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, it'll be put up. And um, if we're a little late, don't yell at us. But that's that's going to be – that's kind of what we're talk, talking about. So, and, it, and if you don't have time to watch it – You can watch it later. Stream it in your car on the way to your next race. There you go. Listen. You don't watch it and drive. That's right. Just listen to the audio. Listen to it. Everyone's got to be safe here. And drive. And you might enjoy the show more if you're not look. You might enjoy the show more if you're not watching us. Well, I don't know about that. You know. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. So. Well, they just cover up the left side of the screen. That'd be all right. Does that look better? <laughs> there you go. Okay. <laughs> so. Well, that's all I got to say. I mean, like I said, yeah. if everybody that's uh, it for me. If everybody uh, has fun this weekend, be safe, go racing, support your local raceway, and uh, have fun.
Yep, everybody have a good weekend. Thanks for tuning in. I